I hate to interrupt your discussions. This is always a problem with this kind of format that <laughs> when you get started then you and heat it up, you want to you wanna go on. But I suggest we make some of your thoughts which you developed at the tables and, and present them in the plenary. So who wants to start with one of the questions or um, or maybe you want to raise a completely different fee? Maybe you dislike the whole EF model. That might also be that would also be at least interesting to talk about that. But yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. I have followed uh, your project for some time and I think it's very interesting that you're more focused on making this uh, knowledge actionable and get it out to the teachers so they engage in actually using this uh, this research. I think that's very interesting, very interesting about the research schools and, and the things you're doing. Um, I was thinking that something that they do in Canada and that we've also been looking into a little bit in Denmark is in order to reach these uh, teachers that you say are maybe not among the bunch of very engaged teachers. We're trying to look into using new social media and video as means of, of communicating research. Um, with the advantage of video being that you can actually show how another teacher uses that research-based tool or strategy in practice in the classroom in order to inspire teachers and make them be able to see themselves do something and also because it's such a short time you need to, you can communicate a lot in a very short time using video. So I was thinking um, if it might be something you might be interested in testing, you know, does this really, how does video work in, uh, in communicating uh, research? And do you think it's something that could be applied to, uh, to, to your program? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, one, one of the things that I, I didn't mention there, um, for fear of overkill, I suppose, is that the, the final thing we've developed with um, an online platform, a learning platform, uh, the Times Educational Supplement, um, is, a, is a course that, uh, on teaching assistance. So again, using the example, where we've, uh, we've used a school case study that has gone through that process. This is one of the Yorkshire primary schools. And they've gone through the process of analyzing how they deploy and support their teaching assistants. Uh, they've then redesigned the deployment and the training for them. And then, so they've used the research, they've used all the tools that we've generated. Um, and the case study captures on film that process in eight units. So it can almost mirrors the recommendations in the report and the head, the teachers, the teaching assistants, and then the experts who wrote the report um, have all fed into that. So they're all, what, I think there are 16 five minute clips um, to exemplify the recommendations in the report. That's just been released, so we've got no numbers of people accessing that yet. Um, what we think, there are 8 million subscribers on that test platform, so we think potentially it's an extra thing that will, that will help push uh, the research and ensure that there's I suppose, less input from us. It's much more sustainable if, if that can carry on and there are, there are millions of people accessing it. If I just add to that as well, I think, so we're use, we'll use that video um, as part of our training model, um, and where that video doesn't exist in our other training, so the leading learner training, we'll create our own and we'll, and we'll try and bring it in, because we think it's really integral to use basically every tool we can to make the training and the evidence base easy, attractive, social, and timely, and the reality is, if we work in Yorkshire and the Humber, you know, for a group of teachers um, in Hull, or you know, it's an hour to get to York, so the actual face-to-face -face physical meeting up isn't always practical, so you've got to use whatever tools you can, and video is a great way of doing that. Um, we're also in liaison, we haven't established it yet, but um, there's a company that is pretty well used in England that uses um, video um, where teachers 
um, video themselves, video peers, and they use it as part of groups. Um, and they're happy for us to use their platform um, as part of our training freely for other schools just so we can do exactly that. So we can overcome those barriers of time, geography, etc., and make it really easy, but still retain that social element. So I think we're very conscious that part of it being a very school pragmatic model is that we're very conscious of the limitations. And if we don't remove those barriers and limitations, then it's, you know, it's hard to change practice as it is. We won't do it if it's even harder. So I think video is an important tool. We've tried to think carefully about how we use. Any other question? Report from the discussion at the table. So thank you very much for your very encouraging project description from the point of Germany where I come from, where something like that is not even close to be uh, excellent. And two questions to the two um, circles or ripples you've shown on one of your slides is, what is your notion of innovative? So how can you decide or let decide someone else what is actually innovative in your sense? And the second question is for the second circle. How do you, or did you have a chance to evaluate the effects of your uh, trainings in any way? And how did you do that? This is a problem we have mm. with uh, trainers in Germany. Mm. Yeah. Thanks. Do you know the yeah, I'll start. start. Um, what, what's innovation? I think our view, uh, we use the phrase disciplined innovation. Uh, the starting point for everything that the EEF funds, and that goes right the way through from the large-scale trials all the way through to um, the small-scale innovation that the research schools are going to be doing, the starting point is the toolkit. Um, so the, uh, that is the best evidence we've got on all the, all the various strands in there. Um, we say that the, the disciplined innovation is about trying to approach it in maybe a new or novel way. It might be trying to apply uh, a particular approach to a new year group where the evidence is weaker. It might be a different subject or, or a particular type of feedback, for example. Um, feedback's a big umbrella term. So, so the toolkit is the starting point. Um, in terms of what the research schools are going to be doing, um, we we do we do have a problem in that that when the we we do we open our funding rounds for our large scale uh, uh, randomised control trials, there are lots of applicants that have very weak evidence on a number of things. So th the research school innovation bit is trying to plug that gap and say, well, okay, we've got something that we think our, our theory of change is good, um, but actually there's only one or two small scale um, studies, there's no control group. Why don't we try and build up the, uh, the evidence base by running a kind of a small scale uh, do-it-yourself trial, with, with support of course. So the schools will be running those themselves. Uh, and by trying to find some kind of estimate of impact, to apply to a larger scale grant like the EEF, we're then, we're then kind of honing in on what we think are the best bets for, for improving attainment. Shall I talk about training? Yeah. Um, I think that's a real issue with us as a country as well. So what we've got is lots of continuing professional development, but how impactful it is, we just frankly don't know very much. Um, what the DfE have released as a guidance document, um, the Department of Education, is the new um, Teachers Professional Development Standard, which takes the international evidence and Tim Pulley's research, etc. It takes, uh, and, and Philip accordingly and Rob Coe, they kind of brought that together. Um, and we took principles from the best CPD around the world and we distilled it into the standard. So things like sustained over time, um, a regular rhythm, robust evidence underpins that research. And 
the key, and it's number one of the five standards, is rooting CPD in student outcomes. Because what a lot of training is in England still is you go off one day to a conference, you hear lots of lovely things, and then you go back and then nothing changes. Um, and there needs to be a slow but well-supported move towards sustained, deeper, higher quality CPD. Um, it's our challenge to try and fulfill all the criteria of what good CPD should look like and should be and give evaluation tools to help schools better hone in that training on student outcomes. I know from the RISE project, our training program in RISE is independently evaluated, but the scale of that and the cost to do that independent evaluation is obviously prohibitive for schools. But what we need to do is start from our very low base and give schools tools for better evaluation of their own CPD and to better evaluate the, the impact of it. Um, for us, we're trying to use our network and the expertise that support us to try and evaluate what we're doing. So it's like a bit like a Russian doll of evaluation, evaluation, evaluation. But we're, we're moving from a, a model where schools undertake training and that's it. There's no real you know, come back to that. But there are organizations and ours is, is one that supports better evaluation. But better is, is better than none. I should just add to that, that the research schools is being evaluated externally as well, um, as are all of our scale-up models. Is anyone inspired by the EEF model, saying, that's what I want to do in my country? Just walking to that's a no. <laughs> what have you discussed at your table? I can make a few comments. I, yeah. I think the model that you, you pick out some, some schools to be ambassadors for um, working with uh, evidence-based practices and then sharing their uh, experiences with other schools are uh, very uh, inspiring. And I think uh, it would, uh, we could use that idea in Denmark as well, where we are, are having um, these challenges with uh, uh, transferring evidence-based uh, knowledge into to practice. So I think it's, it's very inspiring, yeah, definitely. I'd just like to make a comment based on point number one on the screen here. Uh, I'd be interested to know from other countries, really, not from the platform. Um, it strikes me that English examples are often responding to having to deal with a very fragmented system in which there's very rapid change that's driven by policy. So, for example, on the platform you've told us about changes in new types of school, academies, and then uh, new types of association between schools, multi-academy trusts, and then new types of teaching schools, which do the teacher training, and now research schools. Um, and we've got free schools. So it's a very rapidly changing and fragmented environment in which a lot of our initiatives are having to cope with that. Whereas we heard from Denmark and Sweden earlier about quite long-term, highly planned, high investments. So does this English experience really matter to other countries? That's my, it's a comment really, not a question to the platform. Maybe someone from Sweden, Denmark, the Netherlands, Germany wants to react. Is this the kind of situation that you have in other countries, a fragmented system? What I hear about the role of municipalities in Denmark, I would say that's another kind of fragmentation. You, you gather evidence on a national level, but it's dependent on the municipalities of using that evidence. That's another kind of fragmentation, which is all so, well, not hindering, but it's a barrier to using evidence, I would say. And I think in many countries, this is the case. Uh, also in the Netherlands, uh, 
but maybe... We were, I'm from the Netherlands, but they're from Denmark. And we were sort of thinking, how are the English teachers educated? And maybe we were wrong, but we were all in teacher education, and we think that we do something evidence-based, and that they have a knowledge base before entering into practice, and how is that related to... It sort of comes across as something that you repair after education. That, that you need to do uh, when the teachers are already, already in practice. And we were wondering, should there not be something uh, that's already based in education that uses a thing like this, and then that repair mode is not necessary anymore? Or is that just mm. idealistic? Mm. I would say, I think the reality, just which mirrors the school model, is it's fragmentary and there's some really good practice in teacher training, but we've moved from a predominantly a, a university model to a school-led model, so you've had kind of quite rapid change. So I think initial teacher training is quite variable. For, for us, in, in our one individual school, we have five different organizations um, where students come from different areas to come to our school and train, and they all have slightly different experiences, some of which better evidence-based than others, but then I think a practicality is our training is one year long. All the, all the practicalities of managing behavior and all those other things, that evidence often is a bit of a bolt-on. It's not integral and underpinning practice. And then in year two, and for pretty much you know, large swathes of the teaching career in England, that's not sustained, and evidence-based doesn't support weekly annual practice. Um, so the ideal scenario would be a career-long progression in terms of understanding evidence right from day one, but the messier reality is quick, year-long training, and then the busy day-to-day -day practice always overwhelms the reflective practice of, of evidence. Um, so it is the ideal. I mean, Interestingly, we're often looking at leadership and, and those people who are making school-level decisions. Um, so the initial training of those school leaders is 20 years old and, and things have changed you know, a huge amount. So we're having to repair, it's probably um, an emotive but accurate um, word, um, but you have to do that at initial teacher training, career development, and then leadership training as well. So. Um, I think your model is ideal, but it doesn't exist in our country. I don't know if it exists in the Netherlands. I don't think it's, it's really co coherently organized in the Netherlands. Though. So thank you for your presentation. Um, so there's some key elements there seem to be in teacher training, in uh, making research evidence available, accessible. But what I noticed, in, at least in my ex own experience, is that uh, there's also a crucial role, f especially for the principal, the school leader, to prioritize research, uh, use, um, facilitate, and stimulate it. And I was wondering how this ecosystem supports the school leader or principal in this? Let's start. Yes, it, it's an interesting question. I think um, uh, Steve might s disagree here. Uh, feel free to, to disagree, Steve. I think um, f for us in des designing the kind of the the actionable end of the the EEF, um, we have focused on supporting school leaders. Now, the toolkit is useful for school leaders and teachers alike, um, but. The, the guidance reports, um, the advocate partners, the practice partners, all of that um, work to support the system is focused at the leadership level. Um, because we see, um, we see that as the easiest lever to pull to make change happen. That doesn't mean that we're ignoring teachers because there are, as, as Alex said, there are a lot of grassroots organizations that are, are pushing the use of evidence uh, from the bottom up, from the classroom up. 
Um, I think for us, um, the EF, it's, a, it's got a big endowment, we've got a lot of money, but actually only 15 people work there. So we're trying to change practice in 24,000 schools using 15 people. So the easiest lever to pull is the leadership one, where you know you're going to get um, most impact. Um, I think that's the, the, sh the short answer, but that's not saying that teachers aren't crucially important. Alex, you yeah, I, my personal perspective, is it's, it's very individual and probably anecdotal, is that evidence-based practice has not been part of leadership training um, in our country, so it's not integral to anyone's thinking. Um, I think that's changing in part, but again, it's kind of quite fragmentary and um, not wholesale. But I think it's quite a recent development, so the EF is five years old, and I think that's probably with other grassroots organizations precipitated a movement towards leadership, understanding you need to have a better grasp of evidence. So I think we're at a very early stage in understanding that that's actually something a senior leader should have and know. Um, I also think in our country that the pressures of accountability um, and you know, exam external examination results, but then particularly Ofsted, um, the accountability measures and pressures there often replace any sort of longer term sustained reflection on evidence, pilot studies, etc. And, and there, are, there are two strong tensions because if, if you have to have short term results to meet accountability measures, then often the behaviours that you need to undertake for short term quick fixes are often the opposite of what actually the evidence shows about sustainable change. So we've not quite got, got it right as a country about the balance of accountability, support, training. Um, I think it is changing, and I think there are now more supports in place, but there's, there's a way to go, I think. Time for a last question before we're having a break. Is there anyone? Then I'll take the privilege to ask a question myself. <laughs> As a, now, because it seems now that in this session, the relation between research and practice is, needs to be very practical. So they need very concrete guides, even more concrete guides, and then they're going to use the research. But I think also part of a research that engaged profession would be a critical appraisal of research. And I think Steve told us about in the design of the toolkit, well, he wants to encourage at least a kind of critical appraisal of the presented materials, saying a dialogue with what is presented. But that, that's an element I, I'm missing in, in the very actionable and good work you're doing. So I think protocols are, uh, would be part of a profession and, of, and, and not as contrary to auto autonomy of teachers, but as part of their autonomy, but also this, this kind of critical thinking about research. Could you reflect on that? I mean, it's, a, it's an integral part of why the RISE program exists, is to try and support school leaders to have that critical faculty of there is this wealth of evidence but actually how do you strip down that evidence how do you understand you know some of the statistical properties of that evidence and then how would you transfer that into action how would it be different in your context how can you evaluate it better if you were to try and undertake that um, evidence um, in your context so i think there's training that needs to happen i think part of the communication um, is trying to share that critical mo that modelling of critical engagement. So just take you know individual responses to research from school leaders like myself, asking questions at the end of every pe every response is trying to model that critical engagement because I think in our school context over time there's been a bit of a deference to accountability and a bit of a learned helplessness potentially from school leaders and they need support and modeling. I think the toolkit, it, its success is that it does a lot of the distillation of the evidence for you. And I always find that of the, diff, of the 
each topic on the toolkit, the questions it asks on page one are the most important thing. That, and it raises those questions that a lot of school leaders haven't really asked before. They've just implemented and just done as they were, as they were asked to do to fulfill policy requirements. So I think it's, it, there's no quick fix to that critical engagement, but it's fundamental to evidence-based practice that you interpret the evidence, you apply it, you evaluate it better, and, and we need to give teachers and school leaders more tools to be able to do that. And, and connect that, you know, the whole notion of an ecosystem is that you're connecting expertise. And in our system, which is you know, very fragmented, it's even more important.